you. This is Dr. Teresa Grassi. Her presentation is Navigating the Adult Systems. Just her overview is just when you finally figured out the school system, it's time to navigate the adult systems. Leaving a school system based on entitlement or free and appropriate public education to a system based on eligibility can be overwhelming. This presentation and conversation will help inform you about the adult systems and the information needed and the questions to ask. Thank you, Teresa, for coming. I'm so happy to be here. Hello, everyone. Um, you know, this is a presentation that probably should be taking us hours and hours to have a conversation about. So I'm going to give you a high level overview. And as Melissa said, I will stay on as long as you need to answer questions, as well as you could email me and we could set up a time and I would be very, I'd be happy to have a conversation with you. Um, happy that you could send emails, but as we all know, when we're talking about these systems, it becomes a little harder um, just through um, an email, but I, I will do whatever works for you. I, I said I started this as finding the Emerald City. Um, I've been on a um, Wizard of Oz kick lately, and I'm hoping today to really, it's going to give you a very, very basic understanding of our various systems and how to navigate, but most importantly, um, some of the resources that are going to be so important for you. So I, I look at this slide of Dorothy, and it's that comment of, um, well, Toto, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. And I think it's that confusion of all these different players are coming to the table all of a sudden, and who does what. And most importantly, from a family perspective or an individual perspective, what should I expect? Um, and that's going to be the key question that you ask each timelines and what should I expect? So I would love to say there's one place that you're going to go that Emerald City that would have all your answers. Um, it will not. Um, but it's OK, because what I would say to you is don't go it alone. Um, there have been people who have come before you and have figured it out. You have a network of family members who are in it now that what they have learned. And then I would say to you, as you learn, pay it forward and help the families that are coming after you to navigate this as well. So let's start thinking about what we want. I, I had this where we were going to have this conversation, but given the time, um, there's going to be a lot of questions that you will have. And I would say, as I fly through some of these systems, because there's many, start jotting down some of those questions that we could have that conversation with. So depending on where, where you are in this lifespan approach, where your, your child is, whether they're in adulthood or they're still in that school age and starting to go, you've already been introduced to some systems. And some of those systems, per se, will stay with you. Um, but as you leave the school age, um, they will start changing. And so I don't know where everyone is on the yellow brick road here. Some may be just really starting off. Some may be further along. Um, but things change rapidly. And so it's important, I think, for everyone to stay on top of what is happening across our state. Um, and I speak primarily around Indiana. Um, I will say, just because I just spent all day Saturday in New Jersey um, working with the partners and policymakers, and I do, I would say I walked away saying I am so thankful of the resources and supports we have in Indiana. Um, you, know, you don't know what you have until you travel around and you find out what others don't have. So you've been on this road already, this yellow brick road, and it probably started with that diagnosis. and so. You have met the medical profession, you've met psychologists, you've probably gone through early, whether it be ABA or whatever that is, that's those individuals, the medical community that you will stay with most of that life, your life or for your loved one. You entered early childhood, you were there for just a short period of time, and then you had to start figuring out the school systems. And just when you get that IEP down and then you're in high school and you begin that transition IEP, that's when the world starts talking about these other players that come in. 
Um, and that's who you start saying, who are they? What do they do? And why are they in my child's life? Um, and there's a purpose for each. Um, I, I remember my father one time saying, who was a high school principal, and a parent was complaining about a teacher. And he said, you know, if you're going to rely your whole child's education on the school system, I would say to you, shame on you, because what we have to have is a partnership. And that as a family member, he took that responsibility, I want to say my mother, who, who read to us and made sure we were reading and we were doing chores and all those pieces that are so important. Um, but that partnership is just so important to understand why people, you would need a service and what benefit it would do to supplement what you currently have in your family unit. So here we go, hold tight. I'm gonna do this as quick as I can as this nice little overview. Um, and then again, we can talk and have questions. So one of the biggest things that I would say to families is have that vision for a good life. And everyone's good life is very different. Um, but there's probably similar key components that we all have in our life. Um, in Indiana, they use what is called the charting the life course for families across the lifespan. And, and what the question or the guiding vision is a good life for all so that individuals really become very self-determined. They understand their strengths and preferences and needs, but most importantly, they understand their support needs and how to be productive and be a part of all facets of community life. And you see the word interdependence um, because I know we like to talk about independent, but I'm not sure any of us are totally independent. We rely on paid supports throughout our life, whether that's someone I just spent two and a half hours blowing leaves, which I would love to have a paid support for my leaves. Um, but it, whether that is someone doing um, your, your lawn or cleaning your house, we all rely on that. Families we is a big focus to be able to support their own capacities and strengths and what are those unique abilities to nurture and support so that that individual is a part of your life and that you're able to achieve their goals. So when we look at that vision for that good life, um, one of the things I've been very proud of Indiana doing is I really just have shifted to this they've been doing this, but I think it's more prevalent right now of a holistic approach that we just don't look at one aspect of an individual's life. We know that the biggest part of everyone's day is they go to work or they go to school, but what are those routines? What are those uh, volunteering or life skills? But after that daily life and employment, we have to look at healthcare and where this individual lives and how they're gonna get around. Um, we don't want to forget about that social and spirituality, as well as making sure the person is safe, secure, secure and, be, and able to engage in their own advocacy. So the tools that were on that last slide, that website, there's some fabulous tools. If you haven't um, been exposed to them yet, um, I love they start at a very young age, and it's about developing that good life and how it changes over time. But there's some really nice tools to help families think about what, what does that good life mean for your loved one? No, we're not going to click our, our heels and we're going to all just be there and everything's going to be easy because we really now are starting to um, really get into the maze. And just a reminder, as you leave school, you leave that free and appropriate public education because we're entitled to a, a system based on eligibility. And that's where sometimes you're, um, I think you, you, you really are trying to determine how these agencies come together, how they blend their funding. But because of federal regulations or state regulations, there are some strict rules. And, and that's the piece um, to understand of what can you do and what can't you do. So the other hard part is that for so long, the school was the predominant service provider. And now 
you're going to enter into different systems for different services, whether the student's going on to college, going into work, but the big piece of it is that community life. So I'm going to talk some about some of the state agencies and just a few of these here and give some highlights, primarily vocational rehabilitation and the Bureau of Developmental Disability Service. I'll touch on the Division of Mental Health and Addiction. And then I'll talk a little bit about your local providers who tend to have these contracts with many of the state agencies. Um, vocational rehabilitation is the only state agency that does have a federal mandate to serve transition age youth. Um, and I'm gonna show a quick little video about who they are, but one of the services um, they offer is what is called pre-employment transition services. And that is for young adults, 14, and I think it stops at 24, maybe 22, 24. Um, it's a little bit different law, but that goal there is to, um, they don't have to be a VR counselor or, or client yet. And their, the eligibility for pre-employment transition services is to be presumed eligible once they're done with high school and after the services. Um, our state director takes that very, very liberally and says, well, got a disability, you could be eligible, who knows? So she really encourages all the schools and counselors and programs to provide these services to anyone that they feel like they need these services. Um, this is around job counseling, exploration, work-based learning, teaching self-determination and self-advocacy skills. And it also is about those kids who may wanna go on to college, helping them navigate the college world. Um, and then when they're done, they could then apply officially to VR. And I'm gonna show a short little video about what VR does. Then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Bureau of Developmental Disability Services, their eligibility, um, how they oversee the Medicaid waiver the Family Support Waiver, the Community um, Integration and Habilitation Waiver. They also oversee case management services and then the Division of Mental Health and Addictions who guides our local mental health agencies. I'm not about to get into Social Security, Social Security Insurance or SSDI because then we really would be here for hours and hours. So let me sh uh, be able to sh share this. It's about four minute video, but it really is a nice overview of what VR does. Most of us go to work. Some of us right out of high school and some a little later. Need some support to get a job? Indiana Vocational Rehabilitation Services may be able to help. What is vocational rehabilitation? Indiana Vocational Rehabilitation Services sometimes referred to as just VR, is an employment program for high school students and adults with disabilities. If you have an identified physical, mental health, or learning disability, VR can help you gain skills, find a job, start your first career, or discover a new one. VR can even help you if you already have a job but are struggling to keep it because of your disability. How does it work? First, you need to be referred to VR so they know you're interested in their services. We'll talk more about referral in a minute. Next, you'll meet with a VR counselor to complete an application. She will then see if you're eligible for VR services. Bring any relevant medical information about your disability to your first appointment. Your counselor may also ask you to participate in some evaluation. Don't worry, VR will pay for any medical or other type of evaluation they might need in order to determine your eligibility. Once your counselor determines your eligibility, you'll work together to develop an individualized plan for employment, or IPE. You may also do some activities to learn about different types of careers and what works best for you. That is, with your IPE guiding you, you'll work with your counselor and possibly with other service providers on things like writing a resume, interviewing skills, and on actually searching for a job. The last step in the process is case closure. That happens after you found a job. Work there for at least 90 days, and you and your counselor agree that things are going well. Am I eligible for VR services too? You're eligible if you have a physical or mental condition that makes it difficult for you to work. 
and if VRC is in need and could benefit from VR services. Even if it doesn't look as if I have a disability? Yes, even then. VR helps people with lots of different disabilities, like autism, back injuries, other physical impairments, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, or Parkinson's. They also help people who are deaf or hard of hearing, blind or visually impaired, and people with less obvious challenges like learning disabilities, post-traumatic stress disorder, traumatic brain injury, or bipolar disorder. How will VR know that I need services? Anyone can refer you to VR. Teachers and family members will often make a referral for a high school student. You can even refer yourself by contacting your local Indiana VR office. If I'm eligible, what services could VR provide? That will depend on what you need. Services may include, but aren't necessarily limited to, vocational guidance and counseling, job placement assistance, training and education, medical services to correct or modify a physical or mental health challenge, assistive technology, including devices like speech to text software or special keyboard or screen readers for your computer. But how much does all this cost? There's no charge for VR services. However, VR does use other funding from things like insurance, Medicaid, or federal student aid to help pay for certain costs. What if I have a job and it doesn't work out? Will VR still help if I'm laid off or I get fired? Contact your VR counselor. If appropriate, she can reopen your case. You can work together to find out what went wrong, if anything, and find another job. It all sounds good. What are my responsibilities? When you come to VR, you'll tell your counselor about your interests, strengths, and anything that you might need to be successful at work. You'll also help your VR counselor create your individualized plan for employment. Then you'll need to make some choices about your job goals. What kind of work would you like to do? Indoors or outdoors? And whether you'd like to work with a team or on your own? Be prepared to answer questions and to ask them of your own. How do I contact Indiana VR? Indiana VR has several local offices around the state. You can find an office directory online at the link shown here. Or pick up information about VR at your high school guidance office, the Office of Disability Services at your college, or your local Work One office. So I also included the link at the bottom of that slide that you can go to the state website. Not the most friendliest, but at least you can find some information about it. Um, a couple things real quick about VR. Um, it is a federal agency guided by um, the Rehabilitation Service Administration. Um, it is time limited. So they won't be with you forever once, if you heard in the video, once you're there for about 90 days, um, you're on a job and things are going well. Um, I could tell you that a lot of VR counselors will be stay, keep the case open much longer. Um, anyone can make the referral. Um, they have to submit the written application. A key here is that um, by the federal guidelines, a eligibility determination has to be made within 60 days. I find that very um, long, um, but hopefully that can, and they're working on making it much quicker. Um, if you've been in school, your IEP is extremely helpful. Um, it has a lot of information. And then there are times where when someone is needing some additional support, they may and they're not sure if they're going to benefit from certain services, they'll do an extended evaluation. So that is really a very quick way to talk about vocational rehabilitation. I think the key here is that there's they support and to um, gain and, and retain a, a job. Um, so again, I have the website here and I really encourage you. They contract with a lot of different local agencies um, to provide job placement assistance or if you need medical treatment or if there's other things that are needed, they will look at the holistic picture to make sure that the individual is gaining those services to gain and retain a job. So that is vocational rehabilitation. They're one of our key agencies that we work with because of employment outcomes. Um, 
the other piece here is the Medicaid waiver we'll get into and the Bureau of Developmental Disabilities. I have the link here. It's a really nice YouTube link of how to apply for Bureau of Developmental Disabilities or what we call BDDS services. Here's probably the hardest thing that I that comes out of my mouth when I share this information is that, you know, we like to look at individuals from a strength-based approach and all the good things um, that goes on with the individual. But sometimes for like even VR, but really for the Bureau of Developmental Disabilities and your Medicaid waiver, you have to identify those challenges. Um, and so they have you have to meet three of the six categories. And there are times where I've had teachers, I shouldn't be, I hope we're recording this. I can't believe I'm going to say this on a recording. I've had teachers rework their IEPs, transition IEPs, to help ensure eligibility. And the question that I, I ask everyone to determine that is that if I would remove or pull all the supports away from this individual, would they be able to meet these six areas? get around okay, they're learning, financially self-directed, the self-care, the capacity for that independent living. Um, so again, at this point, you could have an individual doing really well, but if there's some level of support you're having to provide, pull those supports away and say, now what does the picture look like? Um, and so even from the least little prompt that you give, like waking somebody up, or, or telling them they have to take you know, a shower and hygiene, whatever that may be, those social, in, those social skills impact, that, help, that helps with developing um, the determination and, and eligibility. Um, some things are changing with the waiver and I won't get into it yet. I would definitely encourage you to, um, I have some websites on both of these. Um, FSSA, the Indiana Path, Path Forward, I could tell you the Center on Medicare and Medicaid are coming in next week um, to take a look at some things. Um, but this is the basically the family support waiver. Um, right now it's capped at 17,000, got a little bit of a boost there. And I think the big thing here is that for those that are working and they need ongoing support on that job site, that's what the extended employment services means. But then here are the case management, behavior supports, transportation, all the other kind of things that um, throughout the day. So this is where it is. It includes respite. As I have a respite there. So this is what should be supplement what's happening in the individual's life. Um, I just looked at some of the data and it seems like um, we're doing pretty well with the family support waivers and most of those on a waiting list are much younger um, children from young, younger families. Um, this is the one that I think people are wanting. The big difference of the community integration habilitation waiver is the residential component of it. Um, it is now in a priority only approach in meaning that um, there's a crisis. Um, uh, family members have are deceased or the family members are aging. Um, I think their priorities are like 80 and older, and then they go to the next level of 70s. And then again, they look at the, everything that's going on in the individual's life. Um, so it's not just black and white. They will look at if someone's in crisis and there's some mental health needs and there's the respite's not there. So there is more of a support for this. They have, they continue to do it only on a priority level for the Community Integration Habilitation Waiver. Um, here again is this website, but I also included because I find the Arc of Indiana gives such great um, information. So here I just sort of identified uh, some of those priorities. Um, you know, if if somebody ha has no longer a caregiver available, you know, moving out of Children's Services or Department of Ed. Um, some extraordinary issues going on. Um, and then of course, anything of evidence of abuse, neglect or exploitation. So um, I would definitely, um, this the path forward is the vision for the new transformation system. Um, 
there are some things that are going to change, but not from a family perspective, it's not going to be as drastic as you would think. But I think they're really looking for more self-directed, which I'm just so happy about where the individual and the family are directing a lot more of the services. And it's really about, um, you know, what is it you really need versus going for all the money? It's like, what is it you really want and need for your, your loved one? And um, because as you would think, there's only so much money that can go around and that's being allocated. So they're really trying to identify those in what are those needs. And then again, the ARC has some fabulous um, ongoing updating and they'll continue to update as things change um, in the state. So here's some others, just so you know that, you know, in our state agency, we, um, uh, someone said to me once, you know, Indiana outsources most of their services, and and they do, um, and if that's good and bad, um, there's pros and cons to it, but what I do love about it are the services are more locally driven, um, and the state has oversight versus everyone's at the state level. Um, your community rehabilitation programs, if I knew a location of where someone is, I could probably name them. There are the programs that will provide employment services or day services or residential. Um, there's obviously the local behavioral health, um, mental health. Um, there are the therapies that may come independently or within a community rehabilitation program. We now have a large initiative going on across the state, both in our DD area, as well as our VRA agency, really trying to look at individuals that have been in segregated settings and are now to move them into more community integration as well as employment outcomes. Um, there's some exciting things happening across the state and, um, and, and then people are moving forward. I would say that like every other company, the biggest challenge we're having, as you would expect, is um, staffing. And it is a real thing. Um, I, I know what many of the agencies have been doing. Um, we had a large discussion early this morning about it. Um, I would like to say it's our industry, but as we know, it's, it's in many industries. So that becomes a real challenge. Um, it becomes a challenge for the CEO to lay in bed and making sure people did show up who were supposed to show up and everything is going well. Um, people are trying to get really creative of how they provide their services. And I know that as family members, some of the family members are providing some of these services as well. Um, so it is something that people are aware of. They're trying to address. We wish there was a really easy answer to it. So a couple of things that I just really, what I, I gave this really quick of each of these agencies is that um, you will have more and more people um, coming to you. And, and when I think about the number of people that really enter an individual and family's life, I get overwhelmed as well and with the turnover. And so I want to address that and, and I want to acknowledge, I know it's hard. Um, I would say to you as family members, um, there may not be one wizard out there so ask your question several times until you keep getting the same answer. Um, and, I, and I say that as spending a lot of time with on the ground in schools and with the agencies. And, and I myself saying to someone from this a state agency, no, that's not your policy, that's wrong. Um, so, or I'm fortunate enough, I can pick up the phone and call the state uh, director and say, this is what we're seeing, what's going on. So keep asking that question. Um, use resources like um, the Autism Society of Indiana and and down and um, the ARC because they have they tend to have their ear to the ground and they can at least help guide. The other thing that I think about a lot is is the fact that um, I didn't go through the mental health agencies yet, but I would just say to you, all our local mental health agencies provide those local um, services. And then of course, there's the private ones. Um, I, I like the scarecrow because he reminds me of the brain and that is about really learning. And 
learning how the systems go through. We just had a big committee talking about systems navigation and how do we make this easier for families. I would tell you on behalf of the Division of Disability Rehab Services, they're acknowledging how complex it can be and trying to say, what can we do better and easier for families? So they know. So all, what he, the scarecrow reminds me of is that you have to continue to learn and continue to ask those questions. Thank you for being here today because I think it's a big step forward. Um, the courage part of it for, for me as you're navigating these systems is to take some risks with the dignity of risks for your loved one and to try some things new that you may not have thought about. Um, maybe it didn't work in the past, but it may work now. Um, employment is a big focus right now for all our entities, community integrated employment. And so trying some things out and making that really good job match and job fit is very helpful. And if anyone ever says to you that your child, if they go to work, they're going to lose their benefits, they're wrong. They're absolutely wrong. Um, we have a lot of different work incentives for individuals to be able to work more hours, make more money, and still keep their SSI or check may go down, but they'll still be able to keep the health insurance, which is so important. Um, and so there's a lot of new rules around that, but please don't allow anyone to tell you they're going to lose those benefits if they go to work. There will be a limit, and they may be reduced to $1 an hour, $1 of that SSI check, but they will still have health insurance. And I think the, the last thing here on this, um, and, and then I'm going to stop and let us ask some questions, is, is the Tin Man. He looks a little scary there, um, but the Tin Man has a heart. And if you recall from the movie, and what I would say to you as family members is that um, no one's going to love your child as you, more than you do. But there are people that are going to love your children and that will walk around, will walk that yellow brick road with you. Um, it's reaching out and finding them. It's networking with other families. It's asking lots of questions because, again, you may get different answers. And so you ask the same question to different people to make sure you have the accurate information, even if that means calling at the state level. Um, so that's important um, to know. And they are encouraging families to attend more professional development that you could work through with your case manager. So I would again um, encourage you to keep learning that piece of it. Um, and so with that, um, I, I would just say as you're walking down this navigation piece of it, don't go at it alone. Go find the people around you to help you. Um, I would definitely um, encourage that. So I'm going to stop right here and um, let people, I don't know, Melissa, how you want to do it. I'm okay with open up whatever, but whatever questions or comments people have, um, whatever works for people. Uh, the first question we had is, what what is your recommendation for housing? Is there a housing system I should know about? It's And it's questioned anonymously. Um, housing. <laughs> that depends. Um, there are different approaches to housing. Um, there, the majority, if you're getting services through a provider, a community provider who offers residential services, what they do is offer the services and they will assist an individual finding, um, renting an apartment or renting um, a place with maybe some roommates, just like all of us would. Um, they tend to have to use their work check or if they're on SSI, part of their check to pay that rent. And then the provider will provide any of the Medicaid waiver services. Um, there's also going through the housing authority and finding Section 8, finding uh, Section 8 housing, which I know is very long. Um, and then, I mean, I think we have across the whole uh, board, we have people who just go and rent a little house or a little apartment and use their checks and whatever services they need. It's from either the family and or from a provider if they're connected with the waiver and connected with a provider. So I'm not sure I answered all of that if there was something very specific around housing. 
Yeah, I had asked where they lived and they said north of Indy, high support needs, nonverbal, CP, incontinent, low mobility, will not likely get CIH waiver until I'm dead. Um, so you could, if, you, or if you're on the family support waiver that doesn't give you very much, that may help a little bit. Um, I would also sort of work through um, with your case manager and call some team meetings, even if you have to get the BDDS service coordinator involved. Um, they're the ones who basically um, take your application, but they tend to serve more people in group homes. But whoever you need to get involved to brainstorm some of those options, I would also reach out to the ARC. Um, but if you're on the family support waiver, then if there's ways to take a look at that, I'm assuming your um, loved one is has SSI, which could also be a part of blending this funding together. Um, so whatever that would take. Hey, Lindsay Monk, she says, last I heard the beads process, only the wait for the initial interview was about 18 months. Do you know anything about if that is still accurate? 18 months to go through the application process? I'm a little confused on that question. Lindsay, let me, I'll, I'll allow you to talk. I'm opening your mic. Yeah. Lindsay, can you open your mic? It looks like talking is permitted. So, um, hmm. Lindsay, I don't know if you could unmute yourself. Um, so I just would, um, my clarification on that is I want to know, oh, Lindsay, I see that you, you're you muted. If you could, I don't know how to. She um, says, sorry, baby, nearby. Oh. <laughs> oh, I've heard those. Uh, she said, I've heard those weights were for the initial application and interview before determination. For the waiver is what I'm assuming. And you know what, Lindsay, I, I will get back to you on that because um, I find that unacceptable, but let me go back and ask some folks at the state level on that. Okay. And Melissa, if you could make sure we have an accurate um, question on that, and I will, um, and we'll make sure we get you an answer. Okay. But that's an awful long time. Um, now, you could be on the waiting list. But normally when you, and I'm assuming you went through the gateway portal for the waiting list and you could always see where your name is. But some of the data that I was seeing was that the, the it was, I, I, I'll go back and verify some of that. I can get her um, email too off of the, after the Zoom meeting, so you could email her directly. Yes, and then um, I would also like to know just how long, how old is your your um, child? Um, because if they're at a much younger age, that could be something, that could be an indication. So Lindsay, if you could also let us now know what is the age group, that would be helpful. She said, I've heard, um, I've heard those weights were for initial application interviews before determination. And then she said, I appreciate it. My email would be great for follow-up and she gave it. Okay, and I will do that. So if that's the initial, and th that's just determination. Um, so I, let me, I will follow up on that. That seems like a very long time. So I apologize, I'm sorry about that. So the next question is, do you recommend a decision-making process for deciding if parents of a 17-year-old should pursue guardianship or power of attorney? I do. 
We have a lot of um, really good stuff happening around supported decision making. Um, and, you know, I think um, depending on your loved one, it, usually what happens is it's the financial piece and the medical piece that is the issue around guardianship. Um, so that's where partial guardianship comes in, or I don't know you're, you're a child or loved one. So as a 17 year old, um, you know, maybe it is power of attorney for certain aspects, but we are seeing more and more um, individuals have be their own guardian and maybe have the power of attorney or partial guardianship for financial and medical. Um, Indiana has always been very um, strict about that. And now I think the judges are saying, wait a second, we've taken every right away from somebody, including voting and marriage and um, other aspects of their life. And so what are those biggest challenges and barriers for them? And it tends to be around the financial and or medical or both. So um, I can give you, there is the Indiana Disability Rights Organization has a really nice connection with um, supported decision-making. Um, and um, that could be something we can make sure that you get and go through some of that information. There's been a lot of training events around it lately and where they're really helping case managers understand it as well. So that's next, a good question, thank you. The next question is from Ms. Cox. You made a comment about not losing benefits, specifically insurance if work increases. Where can we look to find more specific details on that? Can the waiver be lost if too much income? So two different questions. Yeah, and, and um, that's a great question. And thank you. And our VR director thanks you because I was in a meeting with her today and and we were laughing about doing a uh, like a myth buster. Um, I can we will send you it's um, we have a benefits information network that what they do is look at the, the holistic approach. So where you live, if you're getting any like snap and things like that. And now this is years ago, but the biggest barrier for individuals was not so much about, um, we have a program called Medicaid buy-in and the big issue was around health insurance. And so I knew at the time there were people making, this is like, oh, 15 years ago, but they were making 30, $40,000 a year and they wouldn't take a raise because of the threshold. And we have a threshold in Indiana and it's pretty high and I don't have the exact amount, but I will, we will get that for you. And um, on our Center on Community Living and Careers website is a benefits information, some fact sheets. And I would you could talk to a benefits counselor because they would like to see the holistic uh, picture of it. Um, it is a lot more money than you would think before you would lose your benefits. And for a lot, the biggest thing came from people with mental health issues or challenges that really needed that health insurance. Um, and I know people that are making $45,000 a year and they still have Medicare. Um, they were on SSDI for mental health. So I don't know the latest threshold. So we will get that information to you as well. Thank you for asking that question. You've just made me a happy person. So I put the um, the, the uh, Indiana Disability Rights link in the chat box. Is there, what was the second one, Teresa? You wanted us to look, we can look it up right now and give the it's answer. The, um, well, it's fact sheets around the benefits information network over at CCLC. Okay. Um, but I think you could also reach out and um, um, and again that amount for the waiver is a large amount um it's a lot higher than you would think and there's a lot of factors that people they take into consideration like your um transportation for work and all these other as housing and all of that then they look at the number okay and the next question is from Meredith McMurray, we moved from another state a year or so ago. Our adult child was with BR there in high school. He's 20 now. Can we get that transferred to Indiana? He needs more supports than we expected now that he is out of the school system. Absolutely. Well, you don't, you, they won't, 
Yes, and the answer is yeah. We could, I don't know if they do an actual transfer from another state, but I believe there can be a way. And I would say yes because they've done it in for post secondary education. So um, I'm not sure where you live, and we could help you guide to that local office. Um, and so yes, if they were eligible. I don't know where you moved from, um, but we and the fact that he, your child's 20, that you still qualify for pre-employment transition services, so we can get some things moving for you, absolutely. Um, we just need to know a little bit more. Um, and maybe Melissa will put, uh, my, my email is on that first. Um, we're in Crown Point, okay, came from Florida. Yeah, so um, Meredith, we will make that happen for you. Um, you have a fabulous, fabulous regional director there. Um, and I'll take you right to the regional director because she is so good um, and she'll have all the answers. Meredith, can you give us your email? Thank you. All right, we will. I'll make sure it's Kim Dequi is is the regional manager, and just she'll have better answers than going through the local office all the way up. So yes. Okay. Any other questions? I I would also like to tell you all to please email me with questions. Um, I mean, I went through this so fast, but. Got a quick overview, but happy to help maneuver and get through these systems to navigate them because they're not easy. Um, we didn't even go deeper into the case management systems or, or of course, the mental health or social security, but um, those are the big ones and let alone the medical and other aspects of an individual's life. So I appreciate these questions. And uh, Amy has posted the CCLC fact sheets on the waiver in the chat box. You mean the benefits information? Yeah. Yes, the benefits, yes. And and again, they're pretty confusing. I mean, because that's what I think Social Security does. But um, reach out to um, Sarah Level was there and she could help guide you through that. And Teresa, remind me of your email. Um, T Grassi, T G R O S S I at indiana.edu. It's on the first slide, too. Okay. So now, as you guys are navigating, you're going to think about this yellow brick road. And remember just to keep having the courage to ask lots of questions. Definitely. Well, thank you, Teresa, for coming tonight. We really appreciate Absolutely. it. Please feel free to reach out with any questions. I'd, I'd be happy to help.